welcome back again to our show. And we have an amazing, amazing woman here. I don't even have enough word to describe her or to how to introduce her. So I'll let Heather take it over and just give us a brief description and then we will have her um, introduce herself and tell us who she is. <laughs> that is impossible. I will try to give you a brief highlight of some of the accolades and the resume that our guest today has. Um, but this is just going to be some of the things that make Joyce Davis, our guest, inspiring and an all around fantastic woman. So I'm going to go through these quickly just to give you an idea. She is currently the opinion editor at Penn Live and the Patriot News. She has been the director of broadcasting at Radio Free Europe, vice president of um, communications and content at WITF, director of communications for the city of Harrisburg, the president of World Affairs Council of Harrisburg, an author, a reporter, a wife, a mother. Does that sound right? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds right. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I'm just a, a lady who has, uh, like the two of you, pushed through life. And uh, doors have opened, doors have closed, you know, but wherever I was, I tried to make the most of it with hard work. And uh, just happy to be here with you to talk about whatever you want to talk about today. We have a big long list. I doubt we will get through everything today. So you have a standing invite to come back. So the first place we like to start is kind of give our viewers an idea of where they might recognize you from. Well, uh, you might recognize me because I'm opinion editor for Penn Live. So I do Facebook Lives like this one, uh, bringing in people who talk about some of the most important issues in our community. I'm also the president of the World Affairs Council of Harrisburg. We do uh, Facebook Lives. We do live events. I hope we'll be able to get back to that soon. But I also have been in my earlier career on CNN quite a lot. And in, uh, I've been at BBC uh, when I was an expert on the Middle East and uh, Africa. I was called to be an analyst a lot of times. So, but that's a long time ago, a little bit long time ago. So now I'm a local gal here in, in central Pennsylvania. <laughs> so let's start from the beginning. Let's give people context. Cause I think whenever I'm reading through that big long list, I think when our viewers are hearing that it kind of seems incredible. It seems like uh, unattainable, but everybody kind of starts somewhere and, and you had to uh, build and build to where you are today. So give us a, a history. I know you went to school in New Orleans, in Louisiana. Uh, well, is that where you were born? I was born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. And that's a very special city, very special place. Uh, my whole family is from that area, from that region. Uh, and I stayed there working for the New Orleans Times Speaking and really for the first 18 years of my career. I thought I would never leave New Orleans. That's true. I had broken away twice. Once I decided, I always had an international bug. I always wanted to see what other people, other cultures were like. I, and I just packed up and left and said, I'm going to live in Greece. <laughs> and I <laughs> to live in Athens, Greece. I was basically taken in by a wonderful family, uh, a lady who was in New Orleans, and I started Greek lessons with her. Uh, Tikani, Skala, a little bit of Greek there. So I lived there for two years, and then I came back, and I thought, you know, I might apply for a fellowship in international reporting from a, a place called Journaliste en Europe. And I said, I'll never get it. But guess what? I got it. <laughs> so I went off and lived in Paris for a year and studied uh, international affairs reporting. And at that time, there was something called the European Council, you know, commission that was trying to form something called the European Union. So I learned about that organization from the ground floor. So basically I stayed in New Orleans and then after those two experiences, I realized I really did want to go out and try to do something different. And I ended up after getting an interview with a man you all may have heard of, Yasser Arafat, uh, I became an expert, clearly a defined expert in the Middle East. He was uh, the leader of the Palestine Liberation Ar Organization. I interviewed him at his headquarters in, um, in Tunisia. And very few people had been able to get in to, and to get into him and do that interview, but I was. And then I ended up being recruited by National Public Radio to become its Middle East editor. And from there, it was just Zoom, the rest of it. And um, I was in Washington for, um, I guess, 18, 20 years and then decided to take a, a job. A friend of mine, uh, I had helped her get a job and she said, would you come and help me? 
and we were a team at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty in Prague. And there I supervised uh, broadcasts and internet services, a little bit of television to Iran, to Iraq, to Afghanistan, and all of the countries of Central Asia, also working with those who were dealing with the, the residuals of the Soviet Union, cleaning that up. And then after that, I came back home to Harrisburg, where is my home now, right? I looked around to see where it would be a good place to raise my son, who at the time was 14, entering high school. And I thought, if he's going to be an American, he really needs to realize in his formative years, what is America? And I brought my son Cole back and uh, he sunk his roots deep into central Pennsylvania soil. And this is where we live now. So the rest is uh, a Pennsylvania story. <laughs> oh, um, you know, this is a mouthful. Um, you know, you got me, I, I had to unmute myself. I'm sharing and I'm like, oh, when you were talking about Yasser Arafat yes. and uh, you know that um, I am very involved in the Middle Eastern uh, politics and, and Africa and especially Sudan. And one picture that really caught my eyes earlier, I think you were doing a, an event and you had um, Al-Bashir and El Trabi, which they were two of the dictator that were taken uh, by the Sudanese revolutionists recently in 2018. But now, you know, we, we're gonna have a lot to talk about just this sentence. That will take us to the current situation in Palestine and Israel and, you know, you meeting with Yasser Arafat and and going and, and like you said, it's just took over. No, because you had that recipe, you you were knowledgeable with everything was going on and have that interest and that fire. A lot of people that wanted to start and, and have a similar journey or just do something and they don't know where to start. So I think they will benefit from you giving them advice and we will get to that at some point, but I would like to hear what you think about um, everything happening now and especially Sudan, because that's, that's, that's my birthplace. <laughs> Well, Sudan, I spent some time reporting in Sudan, and I actually went there uh, to do research on my second book because, no, actually the first book. I wanted to meet and have a real sit down and get to know a man called Hassan Atarabi. And uh, the reason I wanted to meet Hassan Atarabi was because at that time he was being lauded as one of the most dangerous men in the world. And I wanted to meet the most dangerous man in the world. I don't ask me why. <laughs> it's all like me. <laughs> but I did. And uh, so I went there and I ended up actually meeting him and having actually several days with him, inviting him to his home. And his wife, also Wissal al Mahdi, who comes from a very well known family in Sudan, also I was able to chat and stay with her and ended up doing a chapter in, in my first book on Wissal al Mahdi as well. But um, Sudan to me is a fascinating country. Uh, of course, I look at it from the outside, not from the inside, right? Uh, it's a tragic country as well because of the divisions between the North and the, and the South, uh, Southern Sudan and the wars that have gone on there. But uh, I was fascinated. I was fascinated by the culture. I was fascinated at least by the people I met who, unlike what we may think in this country, don't know anything, never been there, were absolutely incredibly educated and sophisticated and worldly and knowledgeable and actually very, very open to me, to my desire to learn. Um, even things such as the mud baths that women would take for their skin was fascinating to me. But of course, <laughs> there's the other side of the, of the picture. You can't always look at the culture for what is the beauty of it, but there's always in all of our culture a negative and underside and for me that was also I did some reporting on female genital mutilation and that was um, an issue that just shocked me and shocks much of the world when they learn about uh, this practice but um, I learned a lot from Sudan and would love to go back there again well I think you will have more than a book waiting for you if you go there now oh, you're right <laughs> with everything right. happening a volume <laughs> yes 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 and and we will definitely get back to this but your whole life is so fascinating heather uh go for it 
I get one of my questions was, are you the pack up and go kind of woman? And so, yes, you answered that. You just kind of decided and went. Um, so journalism, is that something that you fell into? Is that like a natural path where you were always going to be headed there? And is that something that, I mean, it's a common theme throughout all of your different ad adventures. You know, Heather, that's a good question because most people think, oh, it must have been. I I turned to my mother as I was going into college and I said, well, what am I going to major in? I have to major in something. She said, journalism. I said, okay. <laughs> it, was, it was that simple. But but that's more, that's more complex than you might think. Because remember, I come from New Orleans, Louisiana, and I was born in 1953. I was born into a society that was absolutely segregated that I, there were no African-American journalists, certainly no female African-American journalists anywhere, <laughs> nowhere. So why do I think as I'm heading into college that I can make a living or that anybody would hire me as a reporter or as a journalist? I, I you know, that, but it was a time of great promise. We saw things starting to open. We saw things starting to happen. And I stepped in at the right time to be able to, be an affirmative action hire. They were desperately looking at that time for African-Americans to bring in because of a lawsuit or something. And so they found me in college, brought me and I started working in my junior year with the New Orleans Times Picayune. But you know, it was a good fit because I like to write. I'm curious, I'm extraordinarily curious about everything, about the world. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm intrepid. I mean, I'm not really afraid of anything. I will go anywhere. I, if someone asks, you did all these things and you've talked to all these terrorists and all that, I guess, but I felt that I never felt in any danger. I was never terrified, never afraid of anything. Uh, I'm sure there were times when I was in danger. You couldn't tell me that though. I didn't know. <laughs> so, so the rest, is, I just did it, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, how do I want to phrase this? What was journalism like back then? Like when you first started, like I, I work in real estate. I can't imagine using a map. I can't imagine like printing things and going to people's houses. It's, it's a luxury that I can't even imagine. So back then you don't have a cell phone. How are you keeping in contact with all of your contacts? How are you kind of creating a network? I mean, what was that like? Well, there was always the telephone right? You always could call people. Now it costs a lot for long distance calls. If I was calling people in London or whatever, uh, which is where frankly, I had a contact for at one point for Osama bin Laden spokesperson, I would be calling them back and forth there. So it was telephone primarily. There was really no internet, no, no email at that time. So it truly was making a phone call. Will you meet me there? I will be there at this time and meeting and hoping someone shows up. But journalism, you know, at that time was, um, was a man's profession. Uh, women who came, even the white women who came in felt marginalized, felt they were definitely underpaid. I remember my first uh, months there, the white women in the office uh, did a basically a protest. They together went into the managing editor's office and demanded to be treated like men and a pay increase. And they were met, it's interesting, with a puzzled response. And the managing editor said, I have a very good reason why we are paying you less. He said, think about it. When you go out on a date, who pays? It's the man who pays. And in your families, who is the breadwinner? It's your oh husband who is the breadwinner. So that's why you are paid less. <laughs> so oh my. The <laughs> so they actually have a, uh, a logic behind there was this a, there was a definite logic, yes. Men yes. still use that logic today. Okay, well, you see. Absolutely. There you go, there you go. But that was the atmosphere. And although that being said, I will tell you the truth. Um, I believe it was within five years, I was promoted to the night city, weekend night city editor role, which was meant I was supervising reporters on, on the night weekend shift, uh, which is still, which still was a big responsibility and was slowly promoted to other editing positions when they saw my leadership capabilities. And so doors did open, even though it truly was a segregated society at that time. Yeah. I mean, I can't even, I can't even imagine. So when you're in these different, um, 
sorry about that. When we're in, you're in these different environments, like when you decide to like pack up, go, and you're in Europe, are you the type of person that learns by immersion? Like when you're saying you just met a family in Greece, they taught you Greek and you were good to go. Is that your style? Is that what attracts no, no. you to those places? No, I, I do plan. I do plan mm -hmm. a lot of planning. So before I went, for example, to live in Greece, I'd spend a year uh, with a with a local family going to Greek lessons. So I would have once a week immersion in Greek. So I knew something about the language. I knew something about the culture. And I remember the uh, a memory I have is that I would go to my lessons and the lady and her husband would be talking. I thought, oh, I sat there feeling so uncomfortable because it sounded like they were fighting, that they were arguing. Well, they were speaking animately in this in Greek, right? And I didn't know. All I saw was the and later, I, after I came to learn something, it was like, well, how are you today? I'm fine, dear. Everything's okay. I mean, it was just that they are more animated. <laughs> it wasn't an argument at all. <laughs> and I'm sure you felt the same way when you were in Sudan. Yes. <laughs> even my kids here think I, I'm yelling at them, but I'm, we're, I'm passionate. We talk with our hands and the gesture, and then the words come out. It is not romantic. <laughs> Let's just say that <laughs> it sounds like you're fighting. So right. before we keep going, um, there is a question from Lee Rose. She said, what is your advice for young female journalists? Oh. And then she has two more questions. <laughs> well, that's uh, my, my advice is if you have a passion for this profession, meaning um, you're curious, you really care about truth. Honestly, you care about truth and about facts. You care about allowing a full discussion of ideas. So look, Joyce has her views, but as a journalist, I have to be willing to let the other side have a have their say as well. So to understand the balance that's required for being a journalist, right, uh, when you're reporting. So, so if that is in you, if you have that passion, go for it. But I, I tell this to anybody. It's got to be inside if you want a life of, of, of really fulfilling your own dreams. What is motivating you? You will know it from within. Don't do anything that you're not absolutely driven to do. You need to have that drive. That's, that's a one good hell of advice. I think this is the answer to everything. And I always say that I have I changed my career more than one time, as you know, yeah. and uh, what I'm doing now and what I feel myself is the volunteering is this, you know, the talk show, the things that I do that helps my community. And it gives me that, that feeling. I still feel like that oomph. So if you yeah. don't have that, forget it. And yeah. her other part of the question is, do you think that women need to demand more power to solve their problems? like equal pay, domestic violence, uh, female genital mutilation, etc. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but again, demand more power, but frankly, assume that you have it. You do have it. Just assume that you have it and go with it. Uh, you, there's, you know, there's no reason why you shouldn't uh, be paid equally to any man or to anyone. That is a that's a right that's legal. That's a legal right you have. And the rest, you know, uh, relations with men and all of that, stand your ground, be the person you are, your own. I, I will say one of the things that has impacted me most were the men in my life, especially my father, my grandfather. They instilled in me that I had a right to be treated with respect. But not only that, I should not tolerate anything less. And unfortunately, it stayed with me to this day. So I don't tolerate any disrespect to me. I just don't put up with it, period. <laughs> Amen. I'm on board with that. Yeah. And I think that and like anything in life, it's about practice. If that's the, if it's not coming natural to you, just practice just, and you're not going to get it perfect every time, but just keep walking into those spaces where you're not sure if they're meant for you and just try over and over again. And then, if, and then you'll be like Joyce. That, no, but that's right, Heather. You, you've got the wisdom there. Practice what you don't feel comfortable with and surround yourself with people who are encouragers. It's why I like Hugger. It's why I like you. You are encouraging other women. And you be make sure the women around you are supportive and encouraging, that they see your talent, they see your beauty, they see your potential. 
you've got it, go with it. Do not be surrounded by people who are bringing you down, who are pointing out the negatives. Don't need to put up with that. You need your, your support system going on. <laughs> mm-hmm. Too true. I think a question I always ask women, because I, I, I think we can all relate to this, is what did it feel like for you not having a complete blueprint to kind of copy, to follow? Because I think that is a common theme among, amongst a lot of the people that we interview, is that they didn't need that to go forward. They, of course, I think it might feel better to have it, but they didn't. What was that like? Well, you know, that's a good point. I guess it would have been great if I'd had other... Um let's say uh, black women who had been journalists and that I could go and talk to about uh, things or that I could share that, but I, I really never felt I needed it, uh, to be honest. I, again, I was always pursuing my own passion. I was always driven and I mean driven. This is what I do now. People ask, well, when are you going to retire? Uh, never. <laughs> why would I retire? I mean, they may force me out, but I'm still going to do what I do. I'm still going to write. I'm still going to investigate. I'll be right. If I'm not writing for a newspaper, I'll be writing books. I'll get back into that and, and travel and interview people and find out about Sudan and other places and write about it and interpret it for Americans. So no, there was no blueprint. It truly was. I was forging a new field. I was the first, surely the first African-American woman in that position. And I do believe I was the first African American who was a legitimate reporter. There was something called the Negro News Writer and all of that that they had marginalized, but I was a legitimate uh, reporter there working as anyone else. So, and in other cases, you know, the first at NPR to be on the on the on the foreign desk and to be a foreign correspondent and all of that. So, there, it's it's it can be hard being a first, but not if it's really your calling. Mm -hmm. Can we like talk I about said, NPR? You you paved the road for many women before you, and you're still doing the same thing. And like you said, as long as you love and enjoy what you're doing, yes. why are they asking this question? You're never going to retire because you, <laughs> you're, you're not, this is not a job. This is a calling. This is a, right. something that truly fulfill your life. And it helped every woman around you. So it's a win-win situation. Uh, yeah. Before you get to Heather's uh, question, Leroy's um, asked, what did the traveling add to you? And what, uh, basically, how can we as women empower each other? So those are like two questions. We have a ton of questions here. So we try to get well, to it and get back to Heather too. Okay. Well, travel, travel is everything. Travel has said, I mean, it is the best education anyone can have honestly, uh, especially if you travel, not necessarily in a luxury liner and all, but you travel to learn, to meet people, to, uh, that opened so many, uh, you know, just lifted the veil off of my, you know, my mind to understand other people organize their lives this way. You can learn from different cultures and history, all the history. You've I mean, I'll tell you, we, we in the United States, we think we're well educated, but I never read a book by an Eastern writer. Uh, through coming up through high school or college. I mean, there's a whole wealth of literature, of of of, of so everything out there. How, how did I know we would never have known that so much of our science and mathematics comes from the Arab world? We are so woefully educated and unaware of the contributions of great civilizations around this world. Not just, we think it's just America, but no, it's Egypt, it is Sudan, it's all different places that have contributed to this world and its knowledge. And as far as it, women, I do think we have to empower each other. I think we really have to support each other. I think we have to get, oh, it's easy for me to say as an older woman, because I'm not competing against anyone anymore, but young women should not be competing against each other for men or for anything else. Join hands, sisters, work together, right? Uh, do not allow a man to lure you to hurt your sister. Be the, be the good woman that you were called to be, the supportive woman to your sisters and the loyal woman to whoever you end up being with, okay? That's the way, that's what I would say. You support each other by not hurting each other, by not stabbing each other in the back, by being trustworthy friends, trustworthy sisters, and that when there's a problem, us older women, we need to let you know, you've got a problem, come and talk. I will share my guidance. You will have a confidant. We've lost that. 
our older women don't understand. They need to be there for the younger women. They need to let, you need to know when you're having your tough times, this door is open. This phone is waiting for you. Cause you all, look, I, I was young once. I know how hard it is. I know how hard it is. And I know how many tears you cry. But you have some friends with us older ladies, mature ladies. <laughs> that's beautiful. You know, that's the kind of idea of you don't get to walk through the door and have it shut behind you. Stand right. firm, hold the door open for other people. And then you get to watch all of that beauty go past you. And it's not a pie. Like, like Hajir's one of her favorite analogies is there's enough for everybody. There's yes. enough men for everybody. There's enough jobs for everybody. And so you should have that little bit of a spark of enthusiasm every time you see someone succeed. It's not diminishing your own success at all. That's right. And you have another person who's powerful that can help you when you need it. <laughs> true, true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I specifically want to ask you about NPR because yeah. I, it's a little bit of a nerd thing to say, but that's like a dream job to me. Like, what was that like? What, did that come about uh, naturally? Did you like it there? What, when you look back on it, was it a fun time? Well, it was certainly an incredible time to be at NPR. Um, and, and as I was being brought in at the time when they were trying to improve the standards, at one point it was just a little alternate radio kind of thing, right? Well, there came a point where they became a major source of news. And one of the things they wanted to do is improve the level of journalism. So I was a legitimate journalism com journalist coming in and helping them reshape the foreign desk, and especially the Middle East coverage. Because at that time, they did not, there were no Arab voices on the air. They and I started, we need to hear from Palestinians as well as Israelis. We need to hear from Arabs in Saudi Arabia, and not just the Jewish perspective. So we were able to kind of balance what was going on. But to be honest, um, it was those were tough times if you were an African American. Many of our reporters had a really rough time at NPR. And and you might say, well NPR it's a liberal. No, but racism is entrenched in our society, liberal as well as conservative. And and to be honest, even though I'd been promised the job or that the senior VP had asked me to come and that the job was mine, it took months and months because there were obstacles. The person who was in charge of the department really th wished I would simply go away. She had someone she wanted in the job. So mm -hmm. I simply had to wait it out, play my cards right, and then I was uh, the senior VP said, no, no, this is your job. This is who we want. Right. But it was it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. After I got there, you get in and people ex look for mistakes. Uh, they look for ways that they can undermine you, especially if they were in a place like NPR. Keep in mind, too, there are it's a very prestigious place. It was even then. And there are limited numbers of positions. So each friend tries to help their friend get that position. Mm -hmm. Right. So you enter, basically, it's one of the things they don't realize here in central Pennsylvania. When you're working in Washington or somewhere, you are entering a place that is highly competitive. That is, I mean, cutthroat. <laughs> it is tough. You have to watch everywhere and be careful because it's truly, um, people want what you have. <laughs> I think that speaks to the fact that all of these things we're talking about sound really nice in retrospect. And as we're listing them out, you know, chronologically, it seems like a really fantastic life, but everything had to be earned. Everything had to be purchased with your effort and with your time and your energy. And not only that, it has to be, uh, yes, but it's, it's even more than that. Let me share it. You have to be able to compete, to fight, but not lose your own character not lose your own, not become what the opponent is. So how do you fight like a lady? <laughs> how do you, I mean, you know, there are ways, you know, when I, for example, when I was even supervising some people who um, perhaps had some racial attitudes or didn't want me, I simply said, come with me behind the door here. And once the door was closed, we had it out. And this is how it's going to be. But once we stepped out, it was all peaches and cream, right? So it's, again, how do you make sure that you don't lose your own character when you compete? I think that one of the question here um, will fit perfectly with what you said. Um, her question is, how can a journalist look at events and news when they are evolving with fresh, non-biased way? So that's, you answered some. Well, you know, 
when I first, I used to teach a course at university level and I've taught, um, even when I was in Prague, I taught a course at the University of New York there, uh, trying to help people understand the difference between propaganda and journalism. And so what we have to assume is that we all bring our own world view to things. Even the types of questions I ask are, are, are a sign of my worldview. But we need to be aware of that. And we, if you're aware of it, you need to do what you can to counter it, to off balance. And this is, again, a question of your personal integrity as a journalist. If I know I'm more likely to ask questions that are you know, moving toward the more liberal stance, I need to make sure I talk to and reach out to a conservative who will offer the other point of view. So to be conscious that you do have a bias, yes, we all do, we do have a worldview, and to do our best to balance that with legitimate. Now, the problem sometimes comes, how far do you go? I'm not going to talk to a mass murderer to basically counterbalance, don't murder. It has to be something that, <laughs> that is in the middle. I'm not, if I'm reporting on pedophilia, I'm not necessarily going to put the point of view of a pedophile, right? So <laughs> it's a hard Well, thing. I did that. <laughs> right. I actually interviewed the real pimp. Really? <laughs> to talk about human trafficking. Wow. It was so hard for me to control. And, and you know, and this is differentiated between a true um believer and someone who wants to educate and at the same time have control i this is my weakest moment and i'm not proud of it i felt so many emotions talking to this person and it shows in my face my yeah. questions luckily i know how to ground myself but i it wasn't a fine moment i can tell you so how can you like pay best stuff like that well, I've had to do it a lot because remember, I've talked, I've gone in refugee camps and talked to terrorists. I've talked to people who, yeah. I've talked to people who are getting ready to become suicide bombers, um, and um, you know, and and try to understand. I remember also talking to I, one of the things I did was mothers, mothers of suicide bombers. How do they feel? What are their thoughts? What and to sit and speak to them and. Uh, hear the grief and the pain and the and the anger the anger so you, you just as you say you have to ground yourself and you have to keep in mind what you're doing you are really exposing truth if you do it honestly you this the truth will will, will prevail wow wow that's incredible so do you have any key moments like you're talking about right there that stick out to you? Like whenever we're, we're sitting here and we're asking you broad questions, like broad strokes about your life, are there key moments for you? Uh, like either that you were experiencing firsthand that we were all, you know, back in America hearing about, or what was it like being over there watching America evolve through the nineties from your vantage point? <laughs> Very good. Well, that's a lot of questions, but yes, there are moments, even, even when I was just talking I was thinking of the woman the mother who um, who lost her 13 year old son um, in Ramallah uh, when Israeli troops came in they had been expecting um, Israel to invade that city uh, which is the palace in the Palestinian controlled areas and um, she had been he was 13 years old and she'd been trying to keep him home not go don't go out but the, the kids just were and she says okay just go for a walk you can go for a walk around the block well of course the time he's going for a walk and he'd gotten all dressed up and all was the time the israeli troops pulled in and they ran from the troops but as he was trying to scale a wall he was shot and killed so to talk to her about that and i was talking to her about how mothers can be peacemakers and she told me, no, 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 I will never be a peacemaker. She said, every time they think this is going to die down, I'm going to get the other mothers out there and I'm going to roll it back up because my son will not have died in vain. So that image of, yes, mothers for peace, but there are so many mothers suffering in those regions. And this is the generational issues that we have that kind of grief sometimes is not requited 
and needs to be dealt with. So that's that. There's also the the time of visiting Arafat, but also the wonderful day I spent with the Dalai Lama. I was surprised at all of the photos that Hadra was able to, <laughs> to find. That was a great day. I spent the day with him at a conference uh, in Prague and he came, he was one of the speakers. It was a wonderful conference because they had brought uh, religious leaders from throughout the world. He was only one of many, but he was most fascinating. Of course, he was the most high profile one, but uh, you can see at one point I'm looking at him, trying to figure him out. <laughs> and, and you know what? That's what I said to Heather. I said, Heather, she has a picture with the Dalai Lama. I don't know how big this is. And you were both, especially the one you were both looking at each other. I thought this was like really defining, defining moment. And so are the, all the other pictures that shows where have you been and what you were doing in this life. And it's, it's a true honor, not just to have you on the show today and share you with the rest of the world, but to even know you and, and call you a friend. It is an honor, truly. And I said that at the beginning, you paved the road for so many and you always are going to be someone I'm going to look up to and admire. Um, whether you like it or not, you're an idol <laughs> to me <Nothing>. and others. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say, I mean, I know this is a mutual admiration society, but you know, what you've been through is, is incredible. I mean, your story uh, is so touching, so moving, and you are a light for women around the world. And I know Heather has joined with you to try to help you with that. But uh, that's why I say we all have a role to play. We all yes. have a role to play in helping each other and to making this world better for women in particular. Yeah. You know, when you were talking about motherhood and, and speaking to mothers and the power of that for either peace or, you know, overwhelming grief, that always brings to mind here and now uh, gun violence. And so thinking, I always think about all the people that have um, been affected by that. I always thought that the family members of that could be that force for change. But at the same time, gun violence is one of those issues that for, I think, a regular voter, a regular citizen, they look at it as just lip service. It's one of those things that has never really changed. So from your vantage point, being able to watch maybe cycles of what goes in and what goes out of popular opinion, what do you think are we on the precipice of change on any particular issue? Do you think that you can feel a shift in the culture uh, just in terms of like anything from uh, liberal ideas, uh, conservatism kind of having this, uh, I don't want to say ugly side, different side that's coming out right now? Well, you say, do I see a shift? The one thing I do see a shift in, and we can talk about this perhaps a little bit more, but I do see a shift in racial attitudes. Uh, I do believe that these that um, we're we're at a precipice of, of actually bursting through the next level, so to speak, right? I do sense that very, very much. Uh, I hope I'm not wrong, but I do. Just as the 60s and the civil rights struggles then created the Voting Rights Act and civil rights and ended segregation and changed my life. I mean, I would not have been mm -hmm. able to have the life I had if those protests hadn't happened. And the young people who went out on those streets this summer and protested are going to be the same type of catalyst for change in this generation that they were back in the 60s. I, I really feel that that's happening. I see it happening all around us. As for gun violence, that's a tough one for me, uh, Heather. Uh, I lost my father. Um, he was murdered in New Orleans and was shot Ooh. six times. And that was a sudden and very emotional thing for me to experience. So my uh, instinct is against guns, period. I don't like them. I don't like them for good reason, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, um, so when I always, this is where I always have to check myself because I know there are people who say this is enshrined in our constitution and we must, people must have guns for hunting and for protection and all of that. And intellectually, I buy it. Emotionally, having lost one of the most precious people in my life, who was, who was the reason I am who I am, and was always supportive and encouraging and, and taught me to be the woman I am as a man, uh, for me to have 
lost him in that way with the gun, I can never be a supporter of, of guns, right? So that's just a little bit about me that people probably don't know here. In New Orleans, where I'm from, they know it very well because it was a very high profile thing. My father was a well-known pastor in New Orleans. My sister is still there. She was a big politician in Louisiana, um, but I had to leave. It was so devastating for me. I couldn't stay in New Orleans with its with those memories. Mm -hmm. I am so sorry to hear that. This is, you know, I didn't know that. Yes. And well, you have a good it. reason. Yeah, you have a good reason to, as we all do, I, I don't have that reason, but I'm against mm -hmm. so many. And, and not just trying to take those rights, but have more regulation. If we yeah. have to have them, protect the ones that, who has no reason to die or get hurt mm -hmm. um, by accident or otherwise and I'm not like surprised or shocked that you have a sister who's involved and look at your son I mean he has a, a great role model and he's doing his part um, how how is that how do you feel about that being a mother to a young black man who um, basically you're I'm sure you're feeling the same way I do every time my daughters leave the house and she's a girl and he's a man and men, black men especially, are more prone to get injured, hurt, killed by the cops or anyone else for that matter. Oh, yeah. So how do you feel? It is, it is, uh, talk about terror. It is terrorizing. Yes, it is. It is. Uh, and of course, my son is a young man and he has been stopped. And I, I told the story, uh, and a documentary actually has been done in which I recount the story of my pulling out of, after a meeting at uh, Penn State Harrisburg, my pulling out and driving around a uh, police cars that are stopping, looking to the right and realizing they had stopped my own son. And I then pulled my car over, but then I had to be careful because I thought, what if they think I'm coming to, so I carefully got out and, uh, officer came to greet me, but yes. And I did not like that they felt they had to pull his car apart, tear his car apart, for what? For what? But yes, it is very hard. We have, of course, had the talk with Cole, my son, to tell him how to act when he's pulled over and what to do. But the truth is, what we see is that it doesn't matter how you act sometimes. It just matters what's in the policeman's head, uh, what they want to do. And of course, Cole has uh, this bent on being a, being a politician and wanting to run for office, which puts him in the public eye at a very young age and uh, which makes him a target. He's already been a target for extremists. He's already been, um, I mean, we, I, I insist upon calling the FBI to investigate one of these because it was a direct threatening attack on him, sustained social media attack that involved lies that involve smear campaigns, but that also involve physical danger. And we had investigated. Luckily, I think they have dealt with it well. Apparently, the mo person must have been emotionally disturbed. But all of that is very, very hard for, uh, for a mother, for sure. Luckily, my son seems built to take it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Look at sure. his mother. Yes, I'm not he sure. He was I raised by the best. <laughs> Well, you're very kind. You're very kind. But I'd want him to be an accountant and just sit in an office. <laughs> <laughs> I but feel you. a lot of money, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the funny thing, I knew Cole from before. Um, we marched together. We protest together. We sat together. Like, I, we, we kind of knew each other uh, uh, throughout this whole, I call it mess, uh, we had the past few years. And it was a surprise to me to know that you, you're his mom. And then I said, hmm, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel you, an accountant will be easy yeah. for you. <laughs> exactly. But he thinks- But it's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, he told me that both of you are just fascinating ladies and told me I'd be in good hands, no problems, come and talk to them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, 
One thing, uh, I think, Heather, do you see Janelle's comment? I do, I do. I'm going to read what Janelle said. She says, Joyce, you are so inspiring, motiva motivating, and spunky. And I hope that the young women listening will take your traits, and I'm sure they will be a source to reckon with in the years ahead. Fantastic. She is a cheerleader. She's always here, always supporting. Just a fantastic woman. That's wonderful. And That's she's running. She She's an activist, a fighter. She was running in uh, 199 um, uh, district here in uh, Carlisle, in our right. area here. And she's going to, we're pushing her to run again because she is a fighter. Uh, she right. has that fire and, and and that's what we all need. Um, so the one, one of the questions here, um, how do you think journalists can help in peacemaking around the world? Oh, that's a great question. Ah, ah that's a very good question. Well, one of the ways they can help, for one thing, is to report the truth. I mean, to be those people, those eyes and ears on the ground so that people really have the truth about what's happening. But also, I, I do think that we are, for example, one of the things I'm doing here is to bring people to the table together to talk to be able to share their experiences and their different ideologies. So uh, we can serve as a, as a, you know, a convener of different views so that people can come together and work through their differences. But, you know, for so often journalists consider themselves, you know, we're just reporters, we don't get involved right we don't we don't take a side one way or the other i take a side now because i'm actually the opinion editor so i'm supposed to but a normal journalist is supposed to not have any and in fact there was a debate you know if you see someone uh car plunging do you take a picture or do you try to help the person you know well today uh -huh. I think we try to help don't just take the picture we help so good question we had um john mysick on last year and we asked him at that point um that pre-election that was um really right, right after the election and um fake news we asked him about that what does that feel like whenever you are the target of this uh bombardment of of where people just assume you're dishonest where there's a little bit of aggression that wasn't there before yeah that that's hard that's um Oh, that is, uh, that's not good. There is aggression now, very much so against the media, and it's not good. It's not good for democracy. Um, in fact, you, you must have a free press. You must, have, you cannot have a democracy if people are uninformed. And unfortunately, we're seeing too many American voters uninformed. Probably sometimes. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I have a summer internship program that we run with the World Affairs Council. And I'm going to ask you ladies to speak to the interns this summer as well. But one of the things I tell them is don't rely on one source of information for anything. Get multiple sources of news. Uh, go to the, for international affairs, don't just go to the New York Times or CNN, go to the London Times, go to, you can now translate what's being written in Paris, go to Al Jazeera, go to different sources to get different perspectives. That way you at least can check what's being told to you and you can make up your own mind about things. I mean, I, that, that sounds lovely, but um, from my perspective, up until last year, I did not have a single social media. So when I first got on social media, it was like I was in kindergarten. All of you guys were in college. There was like a, a, a learning curve to figuring things out. And I kept saying to my friends, I'm like, did they not research this before they posted it? And there was absolutely, <laughs> there was nothing in between. I read this, I like this, and I post it. And I honestly could not wrap my mind around that because there's just this immediacy to everything where people put things out. And social media, I think, has taken um, the idea of, of journalism and kind of watered it down in a, in a different way than the aggression way. See, Heather, that's that's very interesting. There, There's a lot of wonderful things about social media. I, I love Facebook, okay? I know people don't have it, but I love- Same oh, here. <laughs> because you, you're connected to the community, you at least know what people are saying. And there have been so many people during this time who've reached out through Facebook to say, I need help. I need help. I'm at the end of my rope. There was one time we did basically a, just a quick drop in counseling session. You need to talk to someone right now. Let's do it. Zoom. Here's the number. So it's that connection to people. But you're right. The other side is you can't trust everything that's up there. You can't trust most of what's out there. You've got to check everything. <laughs> 
videos can be doctored articles can be so you really have much more there's much more available to you now as far as information but it requires you to use your own judgment and your mind to verify so so you're right but i tell you social media to me especially in times like this of a pandemic and shutdown it's your lifeline oh yeah we did a show last week about uh, kind of answering frequently asked questions, debunking some things on the COVID vaccine. And it was honestly, the whole content of the show was just called from anything on Facebook that people were sharing back and forth, back and forth. Because they it, honestly, it was creating more questions than anything, except for the people that read it, took it as fact, and then shared it as fact. And then that cycle kind of created itself and it was hard to get a hold of it. So hopefully last week, we kind of answered some of the, the questions specifically for that. Yeah, well, Heather, you can understand too how with some, especially uh, m many older people don't understand social media and they'll read something. And, and if they're only reading conservative stuff and they're getting yeah. conspiracy theories repeated and they believe- Algorithms. They believe mm -hmm. it, and that's scary. For a democracy, it's scary because they vote that way. And they vote- Oh my gosh, well, for sure. They vote your, the truth out. <laughs> For sure, for sure. Um, so I wanted to, speaking of John Mysick, at the end of our episode, uh, we kind of did a lightning round with him where we kind of asked him some questions from his life, uh, his thoughts on a couple of things from the news. So I wanted to know if you were game for something like that. I'm game, of course I'm game. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he let's hit it. They're ready. <laughs> Okay, lightning round. Let's touch on a couple key things in the news right now. So give us your quick rundown of how you think Biden, Biden has done in his first 100 plus days. I love Biden. I trust Biden. He's a grandfather. I trust my grandfather. Yes, he's good. Mm -hmm. Do you think he'll do anything with student loan debt? I'm hoping. I'm hoping. I think there's a very good chance. I don't think he'll wipe it out completely, but I think there'll be some relief and maybe he'll do something that would be good, public service. Encourage young people to go in public service or politics or something where they're giving back to the community so that taxpayers feel they're getting their money's worth. All right, that leads me to my next thing. How do you feel about local politics and specifically 2022 midterms? Uh, well, the, in, uh, you know, what I was watching carefully was what was going on in Harrisburg. That was a little bit of a surprise. I did expect Mayor Papenfuss to get reelected. But, you know, Wanda's qualified. Wanda, it's Wanda City, too. So let's see what Wanda does, right? And we should all, now that the voters have spoken, rally and get behind Wanda to help Wanda succeed. This is a woman. We need to make sure that she succeeds and that she keeps that city going. I'm certainly pledging my support. Absolutely. What do you think about the Senate race 2022 and PA? Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. We, I will say this. We have some fabulous candidates, uh, mm -hmm. fabulous candidates. I, and I hate to say it, especially on the Democratic side, but, but I'm looking forward to the, I'm looking forward to a very good debate. It's, uh, it's looking, it's looking quite interesting. Okay. Let's do a couple about you. What was your favorite country? If you could like top of tip of your tongue, favorite France. place to visit. France. All I right. There we go. What is one thing in New Orleans that we all should be experiencing? Food, culture, otherwise? Gumbo. You got to taste gumbo. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, I have to say this before you continue, Heather. Last year, my daughter, my oldest, she is like amazing. Uh, she made a whole trip, designed it, planned it, and we went there. I can tell you, out of, and I visited many places. That was one of my favorite spots so far. Yeah. Well, as far as food, you're never going to eat anywhere for the money that you can eat in New Orleans. That cuisine, they, they know what they're the doing. The science and, scene too. Well, there you go. And I'll tell you this, yeah. Russ, my, my, husband, my son Cole would disagree with the gumbo. He would say beignets because he, he goes and he basically binges on beignets all the time. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything comparable up here for us Northerners? To be, for beignets or gumbo? No. No. <laughs> no it's garbage. I'm going to take you with me, Heather. Good answer. <laughs> Good answer. Orleans. Yeah, no, it's there's nothing like New Orleans anywhere uh, outside of New Orleans, to be honest. And and this is from someone who left, remember? <laughs> I left. Yeah. I said, goodbye, New Orleans. I don't want to see. But the architecture, the influence of French and Spanish. Code, my, my family's heritage other than african-american is also french so that's you know that mingling of things is really uh i love the melange of the african and the french and all of that that we get and the spanish that we get in new orleans i love it it makes Last... you feel home 
I felt like I'm home. Uh -huh. that's, that's how I can describe it. Yep, yep, yep. All right, last question. And I know, I think I know the answer to this, but you recently wrote um, an article about how hard it is to run for public office. You've talked about coal being in, in politics. I am sure people ask you this all the time, but would you ever run for public office? You know, that's a very good question. I can't say no. Of course I would run if it, if, if it were right, but I, I won't run just to run. It has to be really something that I think I would do well with and that the people that have enough support to do. But I will tell you, it's really interesting because I never would have envisioned myself in politics. I was a journalist. My job was to look at the politicians, to report on them, to keep them honest. It was just life again, throwing something at you and how do you respond? So I came here. Uh, from Prague, I got this job that I thought would be a good job. And then what happens? Economic downturn. I supervise yeah. three layers of layoffs until it's my turn to get laid off. What do you do? I'm suddenly in a place. Everybody's getting laid off. Nobody's hiring. What do I do? So I got an offer at that time from Linda Thompson to work with her as her communications director. Inside government? Oh my goodness, it took a lot. In fact, I said no three times until I finally said, what else are you gonna do, Joyce? See, I mean, okay, I started the World Affairs Council, but you gotta earn a living. You gotta get in there, right? So I said, yes, and that put me into understanding. But you know, I'm glad I did. I really am because people need to understand how hard it is to run for office and how hard it is to be in public office. And I will tell you this, most of the people that I have been associated from Linda to Mayor Papenfuster are decent people. I'm not going to, they are not corrupt. They are, not, they are hardworking. They may not be perfect. They may have some failing and we can talk about what their failings are, but they all had the heart to try to serve. They were driven because they thought they could bring something to the table. And then to understand once you're in, all of the problems that you have to be forced to solve that you you've and people want to call and hold you up while you're trying to solve the problems right they want you to talk to them and so i was glad i got a glimpse of of what it's like to be in government and one of my biggest biggest issues if you want to see me get angry it's someone who runs for office and thinks it's just a prestige thing it's hard work don't run for a job if you think you just want a title. Run for a job if you're ready to roll up your sleeves and really work hard and really give of yourself and expose your own self and family. People, when you're in public office, people think they have a right to know everything about you, right? I mean, you know, what are you wearing tomorrow? What do you, yeah. what do you mean yesterday? <laughs> you have no privacy. Who wants to really do that? So when you ask what I run, I think of all of that stuff and I think it has to be a job that I feel, first of all, is there anybody else there? Because that's what I would say first, who's who's good enough to do this job, who's ready to do it? I don't need to take it from anyone else, let them do it. Mm -hmm. But if, if there was something that I truly needed to step up, I would, of course I would, just as you would, Heather, just as you mm -hmm. would, Heather, you would step forward if you know you were needed and if you were called. Mm -hmm. That's also and she funny. did. She did. And we're trying to make her do it again. Uh, Heather <laughs> was right. I yeah. voted for her. I went out and, and I think, you know, we, we just need, like you said, you need to look at yourself and see uh, if you are a good fit for this. Um, there is like there is a ton of questions that we're not going to get to. So I'm going to take you back to what Heather said at the beginning. We would love to have you back again <laughs> to finish this. But um, what is the most happy moment that you wouldn't forget? That one of the questions, and I think it's a light one. I think the most happy moment I wouldn't forget, to, to be truly honest, is probably the day I uh, picked up coal from the Louisiana Baptist Children's Home, my husband and I. It was my husband's idea to adopt a son. And I said, I don't know, because I got a lot on my plate. And if you help 70%, I'll do the other 30%. And he said, OK. And the day we, we drove into, into Monroe, Louisiana, and uh, saw this beautiful baby, and we became his parents, that was probably the happiest day of my life. That's a, a wonderful. 
answer. And with that note, Cole here said, mother and son may run against each other one day. <laughs> and I will win. <laughs> Now, don't put us in this position because I love you both. But I am going to vote for Joyce. I'm going to tell you right now, Paul. There you go. There you go. Um, how can you organize your time? Ah, uh, that's important because you have, you can't, first of all, you've got to multitask. You've got to really be able to do several things. But at each day, you really do have to organize what I'm doing at each individual point in the day. And uh, maybe I do that too much, but it, what it does means is that it's hard to break away from simply a relaxing conversation with a friend, right? Everything is, no, I don't have enough time for this, right? So you can, you can over process yourself so that you don't leave that time for human interaction, which is which is not good either, right? But you do have to be concerned about not wasting time. Absolutely. Yeah, this too one similar. question here, it says, do you speak Arabic? Yes. This is from a Sudanese. Yes, akalem tu al Arabia. Yes, although oh, not as well. <laughs> Uh, I also speak some been... Farsi and, and French and German, but it's because I've traveled somewhere and had to learn. I can't say that I speak fluent or beautifully, but I do speak because I've studied a lot of languages. I told you guys, she is just <laughs> another ending, you know, <laughs> fountain of knowledge and beauty and just a breath of fresh air. Honestly, mm -hmm. I am biased. When it comes to you, I've been always, always one of your biggest fan. And, you know, um, yeah, they say, some, say something in Arabic. <laughs> Anything. <laughs> Anna Joyce, Anna Joyce. And Akalem to Arabia. Okay? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Wayne um, in tea, Wayne in tea. <laughs> Wayne in tea. See? Yeah, and me, man. In she said, when in tea? <laughs> Where are you? Harrisburg. You know what? We might have a whole show in Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> la, la, For la. our Sudanese. Oh, you, you can. I'll help you out. For our Sudanese listeners. <laughs> um, Heather, I'll let you uh, end this. And uh, I mean, it's, it's an honor. It's truly an honor. Well, it's it's truly an honor to be with you, ladies. And uh, you both have a spark. Do not let anyone snuff it out. Keep going, Heather. Get back in there. You will have support, okay? You know, I, I'll tell you, men seem to believe that they have a, a call, a right to do it. Women question. Don't question. Be like the men in this case. Just do it. <laughs> It's true. It's true. Yeah. The, the thought process that we put ourselves through where yeah. we try to say, are we good enough? Is there someone else better? Will I yeah. be taking the spot of someone else? That is a thought process that no man ever in his life. I feel like every man, at least in central Pennsylvania, they're just like eating Wheaties one day and they're like, I should make all the rules. And then they just, yeah. you know, throw their hat in and then they ask for money. It's no big deal, but absolutely. Yeah. And the, and the good thing about it too, is whenever you do take that leap, at least in my, uh, you know, situation you know i always thought of you reap what you sow being a negative thing but it was a beautiful thing all of the things you had sown your whole life suddenly were there waiting for you and it was that women supporting women thing and it was like i couldn't um even handle how much support came out that way yeah. so that's, i will that's true and the other thing that they've told it's well known that women generally will not run unless asked they feel they must be asked so that's another thing for us women to remember that maybe we should do the asking of our fellow women. We should sit and say, why don't you please do it? Let them know that they are, they are valued and supported. But again, make sure it's really what you want to do because trust me, public service is not a piece of cake. It is hard. People like me in the media are always asking you questions, <laughs> you know? So, you know, really make sure you're driven to do that job.
Mm-hmm, for sure. The stamina that it takes, the mind power that it takes just to constantly be thinking. I think it's kind of what we started with. It was, if you, if it's not something that's innate within you, you're never going to, you're going to wash right out. You're not going to last. It's not going to be something. It needs to be a sustainable drive that you have. And I think for some people, it's something you can't ignore. Cause I think as women, maybe we do want to ignore the call to do something out loud, but you just can't, you can't, it keeps calling to you. So good for you. Good. For, well, that's how you know, it's true. That's how you know, it's for you to do that's that's great that's really great um and but you're right especially in in public service i mean i look at how many hours and how hard cole works on these campaigns i mean it is his all it's his all in all and i mean in something as competitive as running for office that's what you need people around you and you to be fully committed so but don't do it again unless you're driven (laughs) would you like to end uh the show by saying happy early birthday to your son Ah, uh, is he watching? I didn't know he was watching. All right. He, yes. ver- he very much is. Happy early birthday to Cole <laughs> Davis Goodman. And I will tell you this. Um, my husband and I fought back and forth whether he should have my last name or his last name. And unfortunately, <laughs> ladies, I gave in. And it's not Cole Goodman Davis, which is what it should be. It's Cole Davis Goodman. <laughs> but uh, he's a fabulous son. I'm very proud of him. And I will tell you. This is a young man who God has touched and is leading his way. He will be a leader in this world. I know that without with without any doubt. But unfortunately, it's going to bring him through trials because you all know, you know the trials you've been through in life. Unfortunately, yeah. that's what it takes to get solid character, integrity, leadership. You got to go through stuff. He's got a good foundation with you as his mother. We can't thank you enough. I know you're a busy woman. So taking the time out of your day to sit with us has been very much appreciated. You have a standing invite to come back anytime. And uh, we can't thank you enough. We hope you um, uh, have good success in the future. And I'm sure you'll be back. Absolutely. It's a joy to be with you. And don't worry, we're going to get Hagger with the World Affairs Council to talk about her book. Okay. There we go. (laughs) Yeah, plug that right right at the end. (laughs) All righty. 